Thank you very much. People can hear me. Um, hi, my name is Sahan Rahi. I'm a professor of biophysics at EPFL. I first want to thank the organizers for putting this uh, really amazing conference together and inviting both uh, people who are very much interested clearly in molecular biology, but also quantitative biology and physics. Um, it's really um, nice to have people here and uh, is already starting uh, some interesting discussions. So my lab is broadly interested in uh, predicting what biological systems do. Uh, uh, quantitatively, I will be telling you today about our uh, checkpoint work in yeast, but uh, we have a few other things coming up, and I mention them here just in case uh, uh, people are also interested in these other questions. We're doing, um, for example, asking through directed evolution whether one can change the fundamental dynamics of cell, cycle, of cell cycles. Um, half of my lab actually works on C. elegans. I assume there's not too many C. elegans people here where we're trying to see whether you can predict what the organism does as a whole based on readout from its brain. And uh, we're very much invested in uh, making new tools for quantitative biology. So um, we have a, a bunch of projects on deep learning for image processing. We um, published a few years ago this uh, neural network for analyzing yeast images. Uh, now we're working on tracking and lineage tracing in yeast. Um, we're doing the same for C. elegans, but again, there may not be very many people here working um, on tracking objects in, um, inside of an object that's itself deforming and uh, moving around. And we're creating optogenetic tools. So uh, mutants of, uh, for example, the love domain proteins that make these optogenetic tools uh, more light sensitive or less leaky or shifting the spectrum uh, to which these proteins respond. Okay, so now to the main uh, uh, subject of my talk. So we have been performing this core experiment over and over again and I want to go through it with you. We took yeast cells, uh, which were haploid, so they have uh, one copy of each chromosome. We arrest them in G1. And then using this endonuclease HO, we induce a number of breaks, which we control. We control where these breaks are and how many there are. Um, then we induce start, so cells immediately start budding. And then they arrest at what's called a G2M or DNA damage checkpoint. So all of this is textbook biology. And what we've been interested in is what happens next. So here you see a movie of that. We have uh, yeast cells growing, proliferating. In, rest, in red, you see a nuclear marker. Then we arrest them. We induce one DNA break that they cannot repair because we keep reinducing it. Then we release them. They immediately start budding. But you see they, start, they hang at the DNA damage checkpoint for many hours until eventually here, then here. Then here and here, they go through anaphase, even though they could not repair this one break because we kept um, break, um, rebreaking it. In case you wonder, the rebreaking doesn't make any difference. We could have just filtered for cells that have a DNA break and we would have gotten the same result. So what um, the message of this uh, little movie is that surveillance systems in biology can fail. And this has been seen all across biology. So, for example, I showed you the example of the DNA damage checkpoint that was known to be overwritten, or people called uh, said adaptation. There was adaptation to the DNA damage checkpoint, but this had been known um, to happen in yeast. This, no, this happens in C. elegans. This is thought to occur in mammalian cells. Uh, another checkpoint, the so-called spindle assembly checkpoint, which is an important anti-cancer drug target. Um, is um, overridden in yeast cells and mammalian cells, and this even occurs in development. So uh, here's a beautiful experiment in flies that go from, from larvae to pupae about 120 hours post egg laying, and when uh, researchers interfere with the development of their wings by expressing a proapoptotic gene in their wing imaginal discs, these flies don't go through the transition on time, they're not arrested forever, they're just delayed by about 40 hours, and then all of them go through the transition, even though uh, they end up uh, severely crippled. So, um, these observations have been, had been made all across biology, but what was missing was a framework for bringing these observations together. On the other hand, what uh, people traditionally do is molecular biology and genetics, so uh, understanding how you know, there's a DNA break, it's resected, coded with RPA, then DDC2 MEC1 turns on, and through a cascade of uh, steps, RAD53 turns on, stopping this, the, the cell cycle. 
um, this, uh, these kinds of, uh, this kinds of work had been, uh, there's, with, with a lot of success, had been carried out, but that's like trying to understand how a combustion engine works by knowing every nut and bolt in it. We don't come away understanding how the overall system works. So um, we, were int we became interested in this, and we noticed that in the discussion sections of these papers, people kind of speculated how this phenomenon of checkpoint override, um, again called adaptation or slippage, there are different words for it, um, they compared it to a Hail Mary pass in American football or a last-ditch effort to survive. And what presumably uh, these researchers meant is that um, biological systems may be striking a balance between risk and speed. So risk meaning, suppose you have no checkpoint, the cell runs, uh, uh, continues with the cell cycle with damage, it likely dies because it didn't arrest at all. But then if it's arrested forever, then it's also essentially dead, in, in, um, uh, from evolutionary speaking, because it's being outgrown by all of its competitors. So we wanted to take this speculation, turn it into a quantitative theory, then make new predictions using the theory, and then check experimentally whether we can observe new patterns. I think you can agree that this is a very simple fundamental problem, but at least quantitatively it had not been addressed before. So I just want to give you a flavor of the math, but I'm not going to go into it beyond this one slide. Just kind of like how did we approach this problem? So we started very simply. We assumed that a cell divides with a period T prime, and then in some cell cycle there's some damage, and because of this damage it arrests an extra time T. And then there are three possible outcomes. Uh, both mother and daughter can be alive at the end, only one may survive or neither may survive. And if we just count what's the expected number of progeny at some future time point, that is two to the power of the number of cycles that could have occurred, so which is the time when you ask the question minus this arrest time divided by the doubling time. So this is purely just asking kind of like how many divisions could have occurred times the probability that both progeny are alive plus one half times the probability if one is alive plus zero if neither is alive. And if you just plug in t prime is t log two, you get this function out, uh, which says that the expected number of progeny should decrease exponentially as you wait longer. Okay, the longer you wait, the fewer progeny you should expect. And then the longer you wait, on the other hand, you may have a greater chance of repairing the problem. And so between these two terms, there may be an optimum. And we did sort of a, a lot of sort of uh, simulations and calculations to show that the right thing to consider from an evolutionist perspective ought to be this function and how this ought to be maximized um, in the course of evolution. Um, what you come out with is at the end a simple, maybe there's an illustrative way to, to explain this problem. And um, the illustration is as follows. Cells live in, in so-called error time plane. So they, they start out with some amount of errors, say DNA breaks, and then they move forward in time, and then they stoch stochastically fix these errors. And naively, maybe according to the biology textbooks, you would imagine that cells have to fix all of their errors before they can continue with the cell cycle. And the first mathematical question that we answered is, is there a boundary in this error time plane such that if the cell hits this boundary, it's the optimal time to override the checkpoint, even if not all repairs have um, occurred that could have occurred? And so, uh, going again th through the steps of the math, we came up with a very simple equation that says, when is the optimal time to override a checkpoint? So the optimal time to override the checkpoint is given by this formula, which says that it is given to you, the optimal time to override the checkpoint is when the probability of repairing an error, of repairing a DNA break, say, is equal to the probability of survival if the checkpoint is overridden, divided by the number of breaks and divided by the doubling time of the organism. So there are four parameters in this equation. Two of them we know are control. So the number of errors will be the number of DNA breaks. We induce them so we know exactly how many there are. The doubling time we will be working in yeast is about 90 minutes. And then there are two parameters that we had to measure to fit into this equation uh, to predict what's the optimal time to override the checkpoint. So one is the repair probability for one error, for one DNA break, and this S, the survival probability, if one overwrites the checkpoint with one error. Okay, so first we want to measure what's the probability of repairing a DNA break. And even though this is a very old uh, field, it turned out there was no sort of clean quantitative data on how fast DNA breaks are repaired. 
And to do, and it turns out actually not to be in principle very easy, but we came up with a simple trick to do it. And the trick is this, we took a gene in yeast that's very strongly expressed, ADH1, and we fused it to a yellow fluorescent protein and put a cut site for this endonuclease HO between the promoter and the open reading frame. So now cells will start out with intact DNA, high levels of fluorescence, we induce a break, fluorescence goes down, and through start, checkpoint arrest, and override, fluorescence is down unless the break is repaired. Okay, and this is what these cells then look like under the microscope with either uh, with repaired breaks or without repaired breaks. Sort of a very strong difference in fluorescence. So then we could use these cells now uh, with flow cytometry to measure DNA break repair. And the way we did it is follows. My student, he took these cells and the flow cytometer showed on the x-axis yellow fluorescence, on the y-axis uh, forward scatter, I think, which um, correlates with the size of these cells. And you see at least two, after four hours after induction of the break, there are two populations. One is dark and big, dark because it's sort of towards the, uh, the left, and big. These are the cells with DNA breaks, which uh, are both big and uh, don't, don't express yellow fluorescence. And small and bright, these are the ones that presumably have repaired the break. And so he would then sort out a million of these cells, and then every two hours, again, sort out 50,000 dark cells, and then plate them on plates, and, uh, and then count after a few days how many colonies he's ob he observed. And so the reason we think we could uh, measure DNA break repair in this way is that between these time points, we expect cells to repair their breaks, yellow fluorescence shoots up, and these cells are no longer dark and are not being sorted out. And so the difference in, in these numbers of colonies should reflect the number of cells that between these time points have repaired the break. And so this is, these are repetitions of these experiments. Each one of these circles is a repetition in which um, uh, we measure the fraction of colonies, cells that turn into a colony among all that were plated. And you see their numbers are going down in time. And so the difference between these time points is the number of repaired cells. The derivative is the rate of DNA break repair. And when we knock down non-homologous end joining, these numbers collapse. So this is not some artifact of the way we're doing these experiments. Okay, so then this is uh, the derivative of this fit is the rate of DNA break repair. And you remember this is the equation that we're trying to use. So that's the left-hand side of this equation. Here, the dotted line is that negative of the derivative. And the right-hand side, the survival probability, we measured in very much the same way. And now what this is saying is that when these two sides are equal, that's the optimal time to overwrite the checkpoint, which means that for one break between six to 10 hours, is the optimal time to override the checkpoint, 14 hours for two breaks, 16 hours for three breaks, and then we extrapolate it here for four breaks. Okay, so first of all, with this, we recreated this boundary that I was describing to you in the error time plane for DNA breaks. Okay, so let's check our, um, our predictions. Our prediction is that the optimal time to override the checkpoint is somewhere between six to 10 hours for D one DNA break. Now we went and did the experiment and we measured how long do cells actually take to override the checkpoint with one break. And under the microscope, we saw between five to nine hours. If you adjust for those, ex uh, the previous experiments were done with facts. These are under the microscope where we subtracted the time to budding. So you have to add about one hour to this to make these two experiments comparable. So exactly actually six to 10 hours with a mean of eight hours, exactly as predicted. Okay. Next prediction, with two breaks, the optimal time to override the checkpoint would be 14 hours. We did the experiment, we induced two breaks, and then we measured how long cells take to actually override the checkpoint, and we saw exactly 14 hours. We did it with three breaks, the prediction was 16 hours, observation was that actually they took 17 and a half hours to override the checkpoint. Four, four breaks, we extrapolated, uh, uh, because we didn't have the data, to about 19 hours, we did the experiment for four breaks, it took cells about 21 hours to override the checkpoint. Okay, so, so far, I've told you that um, um, uh, how long cells arrested before overriding the checkpoint uh, with a fixed number of breaks. Now we ask another premise of this whole theory, is that the DNA damage checkpoint is monitoring how much time has passed, how many errors have been fixed, and then making a decision. 
is this, can we support this, this, uh, uh, this kind of premise of this whole theory? So for example, can we check whether the DNA damage checkpoint updates itself dynamically? So we could do that by creating two different kinds of break. One kind of break can be repaired, another break cannot be repaired. The reason the one that can be repaired can be repaired is that we uh, introduced a, um, a piece of homology so that it could be very quickly repaired with homologous recombination and the other could not. So if this behaves like two breaks, the DNA damage checkpoint is not dy up uh, dynamically updating. It's just measuring how much uh, DNA breaks there is in the beginning and then uh, arresting a certain amount of time. But if these two breaks behave like one break because one is being repaired, then the DNA damage checkpoint is dynamically updating depending on how much time has passed and how many errors have been fixed. So we did the experiment and we saw exactly that cells override again after eight hours, which is exactly how long they over, um, wait for one break, which means that the um, DNA damage checkpoint is dynamically updating. Finally, so far I've showed you uh, what the theory predicts is the optimal time to override the checkpoint and how long cells actually take to override and these two matched well. We asked finally, can we show directly that override is beneficial? And to do so, we used our reporter for the DNA, um, uh, uh, for the DNA break together with a mutation which makes cells override incompetent but we haven't seen any other effects of this mutation. And we saw that using this reporter, we could filter out cells that had a DNA break after many hours, and then you see a difference in their likelihood of survival. So meaning if they can override, they have a greater likelihood to survive. So in this work, we showed how um, we created a theoretical framework for checkpoint override. We made predictions using parameters all at the system level. So far, I haven't seen anything about the very complex um, DNA uh, damage response machinery. We measured the parameters of the theory, including these very rare DNA break repair events, and then plugging into the theory, we were able to uh, predict the override times uh, fairly accurately. And we showed uh, for the first time directly that override is actually beneficial. So uh, now often um, I'm asked, uh, isn't this very particular to single cell organisms because they only care about their own fitness? Actually, um, if you think about your germline cells, they are a little bit like yeast. Because if your germline cells do not divide, you are effectively also dead for evolution. And it turns out that um, uh, the, uh, checkpoints in germline cells and in the early embryo, for example, are also leaky. Okay? They're not completely tight and they're also not absent, even though that's sometimes claimed that they're completely absent. Um, uh, one of our interests is whether checkpoints are remodeled in cancer in the way that's predicted, and the way that it is predicted, again, is not that the checkpoint is completely absent or that it's completely tight, as it should be in somatic cells, but it's somewhere in between because that gives you the best growth rate. And then, uh, just kind of like generally, this question of speed versus risk um, is, um, should be applicable beyond um, just the DNA damage checkpoint. Okay, so what are we doing now? So now we're interested in um, how is this decision computed. So how does the DNA, this very complex machinery of proteins that unfortunately talk to each other through phosphorylation, which makes everything very complicated, um, how does this machinery t uh, measure the amount of time and measure the amount of damage there is and then, and then reach a decision? So here we're using um, optogenetic switches that we're introducing in these proteins that presumably compute this decision and trying to tease out where in the uh, network is the timer at least, what, uh, which protein is counting time um, uh, until uh, checkpoint override. And then there is an even simpler, uh, there's actually quite a simple sounding problem that is also not entirely resolved, which is what is the signal that's maintaining the DNA damage checkpoint? And there have been two models. So one model is that after a break, the DNA damage checkpoint counts the number of uh, liberated ends, and that's what's determining the override time. Again, you saw the more breaks, the longer it's arresting, versus uh, how much, as, so after the break, one of the two strands of DNA is being resected, um, does the DNA damage checkpoint measure the amount of single strand DNA that's either liberated or coded? And so there's, there have been these two models in the literature, and we first thought we could address this very, um, you know, in a standard way. We took two mutants that uh, basically knock out uh, resection, and we measured how long um, cells take to override. And we saw that with one break, 
uh, the, uh, they overrode, uh, overrode about, um, after about seven hours, and we had measured pr previously between seven to eight hours, so it seems that resection is not really important for um, maintaining the DNA damage checkpoint. And then we thought, we well, let's check this with two breaks, and with two breaks, we had previously seen about 14 hours, and now the mean was down to eight to nine hours. So it seems like, kind of like, it's very messy. It seems like resection is important, it's not important. And the problem is with these genetic approaches that you knock out a gene and you think it's only doing one thing, but it's also doing some other thing, right? So how do you disentangle that? So we've now been working on a, uh, something else, uh, a different approach, which is to create what we call optogenetic tripwires. So which means that uh, we create a break and at some distance from that break, we have an inducible transcriptional system. And so as long as resection hasn't hit this transcriptional system, we should see fluorescence. And then um, when it's hit it, fluorescence should come down. And so in these early experiments that we're doing with this, we've already seen some interesting things. So one is that if you have a DNA break, fluorescence goes up, presumably resection hits the reporter, fluorescence goes down. But if you have another break somewhere else in the genome, turns out this time is delayed. So this tripwire isn't triggered at the same time as when there is a, there's one break. The, the second break retards the resection of the other break. So two breaks are talking to one another. They're influencing one another. Um, so now we want to take this uh, a step further and uh, measure exactly how long um, is the, what is the resection rate versus the override time. And if model one is correct, then resection rate should not influence the override time. For, uh, it should just depend on the number of ends. And if these two things are correlated with one another, then model two should be correct. Single-strand DNA may be influencing override. And so we've done these experiments and we found neither model one nor model two to be correct. And, uh, and, and here's what we find. When we plot the resection time, so the inverse of the speed, we find that the later cells uh, the slower resection is, the longer it, it takes this uh, tripwire to be triggered, the longer it takes to override. So this is exactly the opposite of both of these other models, and right now we're trying to figure out basically what's going on. So a uh, summary of what we're doing right now is that genetics t tells us that a combination of DNA breaks and resected DNA may determine override times. When we have multiple breaks on different chromosomes, that slows down resection. Breaks are talking to one another and unexpectedly um, slower resection leads to later override, contradicting the, uh, the current models. So with that, I would like to thank my lab and um, the funders. Uh, yeah, very, very nice talk. So they, there is a, a locus in, in cells that accumulates most of the breaks, the spontaneous breaks in normal growth conditions, which is the RDNA and it has multiple copies, like 200 copies, unless the cells need maybe 30 for growth, but they have 200 copies, and they tolerate breaks very, very well at this locus. So I was wondering whether, because, I mean, it's repetitive, so whenever you have a break or you have an error or whatever, it will be eliminated due to gene conversion. So do you think that the, the, the position in the genome matters in terms of how long the cells will... Uh, adapt or you know the, the time of the adaptation is it dependent on on the on the position in the genome uh, great question uh, we haven't tested uh, near our DNA we have tested so okay so all of this work I didn't mention it um, we created DNA breaks in places we thought are innocuous so we put the breaks in regions of the DNA that we know or have other people have shown that you can just take out this whole chunk of like 10 kb around the break and it doesn't have an effect, uh, cells, cells survive. So that's where we've put these breaks and it didn't seem to matter very much where they are, were. The, this adaptation time stayed the same. Um, what we found, however, is that if you put the break right next to the telomere, extremely close to the telomere, or right by the centromere, the answers were completely different. Cells overrode basically almost immediately. There was hardly a checkpoint. And, but your location, it's interesting. We haven't thought about that. We didn't put it there. There is a Japanese lab, if I remember correctly, who proposed that the, this locus was made big and difficult to replicate and repair on, on purpose to, use, to be used to, to serve as a decoy for problems. 
So but when you are in suboptimal conditions, that's the place where the problem will happen first, and and at no cost because you can repair it uh, quite uh, without consequence. So I'm always wondering whether it, how it would fit with your model. That maybe it's something we can discuss. Maybe we should something we <laughs> have to think about a little bit. <laughs> It. Yeah, fantastic story, Jamal. Um, I wonder in the theory part, uh, the assumption I, I believe is that uh, if a damaged, unre if an unrepaired damaging, if a cell with an unrepaired damage divides, the cell is dead or, or not. Because I would think that there is some reduction in fitness. And then you need to have this fitness coefficient after, in, in the case of you're taking the risk. So what's the cost of this risk in terms of fitness? So have you extended this, this theory for the case when there is like a finite reduction or it doesn't go ra right to zero? Okay, Leonid, you're asking a great question. Uh, if I can, uh, can maybe repeat it to make yeah. sure I understood. You're saying, you're assuming um, you either survive and you're just fine or, uh, or you're dead. Right? And, okay, so this was based on our observations that cells that did override, and we, um, we see that they, uh, with, with, uh, with override, they tend to survive better. At least the size of the colony didn't seem to be very different among them. So it didn't seem, it seemed like they eventually either repair or they don't repair. The, the break, it's not like they lose a good chunk of their genome and then they repair. At least we, we have not seen that. That could be happening, but that doesn't seem to be the, the majority of the cases. And therefore, here we didn't take that into account, that you may lose, that there is like a third option that you either repair like right away or like you lose some and then you repair. We just didn't take that into account. Obviously, theoretically, you could. It's just like a slight like compl complication of the, of the equation, but um, there didn't seem to be kind of like a strong experimental reason for us to pursue that, at least here in yeast. It could be different, in, or at least yeast and the breaks that we were looking at. It could be different in other organisms, so that would be very interesting to us. So, so in the related question, so if you can interfere with the ability to override checkpoint, can you compete the cells against the, against the wild type and see what's the fitness advantage, measure the fitness advantage of overriding the checkpoint at specific points? Uh, Great uh, idea, we haven't done that. We could knock down, exactly, we could make cells um, uh, um, incompetent. Uh, um, yeah, we could make them override incompetent and then compete them against exactly. the ones that are competent exactly. and then maybe under conditions where we also like irradiate them and make them just exactly. generally fairly miserable t so that you know, these differences uh, uh, um, you know, come out. Yeah, we haven't done that, good idea. Yeah. yeah, very nice talk. So I was wondering, so in your fluorescent uh, selection system that you showed first, right, I, I was wondering how do you get back to the fluorescent cells when they adapt? Because I think in the early days, Jim Haber showed that you can have resection over many kilobases of, of DNA when you have an unrepairable break. So how does that work in a resected context? Okay. So fluorescence is high because the promoter is attached to the f reading frame. Uh, we cut. Uh, fluorescence either comes down or is it diluted? I mean, for whatever, many reasons it comes down. We have a degron on the um, fluorescent protein. And then when it's repaired, it shoots back up. And you are saying, uh, what, what it's re while it's resected, we should see no fluorescence. Exactly. Yeah. But after repair, it should come back up. Right, but are these breaks resected in the first place? I think that's the question. So that would also match with the fact that you can probably take out resection out of the equation, right? So in, in a sense, are there cells where you have extensive resection or are there cells where you don't have extensive resection at the break? And are these the cells that probably go into adaptation? I am just a little confused. I'm a little confused about the question. Okay, You're okay. saying if there is resection, uh, shouldn't fluorescence, so fluorescence is down, that's fine, and then it's repaired, fluorescence should go back up. And which, what is the question? I just don't understand the question. How can you repair through an HEG if you have a so long resection, I guess? Without what, what, losing, without losing okay, the information. So that's something that you brought up to us yeah. and when we met uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, I just do not, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the question like, how is it possible that this works? I don't know. I mean, uh, how can it? I don't know. <laughs> it, I mean, it's a very, I mean, it's a good question. It's just that, you know, we... I think the 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 the, um, the kind of like answer you and I worked out when, when we met is that presumably the cells that end up uh, 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 fixing the break very late are those that didn't resect very much. Okay, yeah. 
that was yeah. uh, kind of like the place we got and that there are certain predictions to be made for that. For example, if you stop resection, you have a higher chance of survival because uh, they, will, uh, they will be better able to do non hormonal end joining. Just let me say one thing. We're pursuing here very rare repair events. So I doubt that these, and I think, but, but these are what's important, I think, to have selected for um, override in the course of um, evolution. It doesn't mean just because 99% don't do it, that 1% could not have been the 1% that is, um, has, 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 has made override to be a beneficial strategy, or less than actually 1%. So I don't think these things could have been ever seen in like bulk assays, or, e or even very sensitive assays, unless you go to single cell. So, yeah. yeah. I, I hope I answered part yeah, of the yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Very nice talk. I, I was just wondering, uh, can you estimate what's the minimum threshold that the cells will sense to act uh, where, 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 when there, if there is a, uh, the, the minimum threshold uh, to sense where there is a DNA damage or a cut, so the cells activate the, the checkpoint and arrest until the, the damage is repaired? Uh, one break. So, I, I mean, we're, we're just doing double strand DNA breaks, but one is enough to activate the checkpoint and arrest for these eight hours. Yeah, but what, what's the minimum threshold of, is that of amount of uh, a number of breaks or? Uh... Uh, sorry, I, 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 I mean, I'm not understanding that question either, but one, so one, so uh, they arrest if there's one break, right? What is the minimum? Um, I mean, less than one break would be, I mean, single strand damage or something. I mean, I'm just... But do you think that yeah, the damage is repaired or just the cytokinesis is not blocked anymore and then? Or what, sorry? If the damage is repaired, yeah. then? And if not, then the, the cell just continues and cytokinesis just uh, is not blocked anymore. Okay, so if it's repaired, then the cell immediately continues, right? Anaphase just continues. If it's not repaired, then you have these long arrests and then overrides and then, and then either so survival or mostly just, death. There, if there is just only one damage, then the cell will stay arrested until the damage is repaired. No, eight hours until override. Right, so eight hours and then 14 for two, 16 for three, et cetera. So there's a kind of like a whole cascade of times depending on how much, how much, how much damage there is. Yeah, so great talk. Um, I, was, I was wondering, I mean, this cross talk between the two breaks, so mm -hmm. how do you think it works? I mean, it's shown that uh, when you have two breaks, they come together in the, in the nucleus. So do you think this is this or do you think that it's um, more like a simpler model where exo one will be limiting? So did you try to overexpress exo one and see if you... Uh, we haven't... Uh, uh, so overcome this. great question. How do these uh, different DNA... How is it possible that uh, uh, having another DNA break is affecting the processing of the first one? Um, here or, or these delays here, uh, we really don't know. I mean, uh, you say it's a, a, a it's could, yeah, we just don't know. Um, one idea is that there is a limiting factor that's important for resection, and because you have one break, you're kind of reducing that, and that should make very clear predictions. I mean, even without overexpressing, we should be able to predict then how long does resection change if you have two breaks in the background or three breaks, because each one would presumably be randomly uh, 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 pulling away these factors that are needed. Just haven't gotten to it. So just all ongoing work right now. <laughs> yeah.